Hi everyone, I'm Caroline McKinnon from the Inclusive Research Collective and I'd like to welcome you to the second event of the Small Talks for Big Change seminar series. These events are a collaboration between the Perivoli Africa Research Centre and the Inclusive Research Collective and they're a series of short sessions where we're going to begin to look at the layers of power imbalances between research collaborations between the Global North and researchers in the African continent. These events are recorded for colleagues who can't attend live. And if you missed the first session in this series, a link to the recording will be put in the chat and closed captions are available in English or French. Um, if you would like closed captions for this live event, please click the CC button on your screen to enable this. And we recognise the importance of honest conversation, but as a polite notice, we do expect our speakers and other attendees to be treated with respect at all times, and failure to do so will result in you being removed from the session. If you have any questions, please put these in the, the Q&A or the chat for afterwards. And it's a great honour for me to be able to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Catherine Chubutungi, who is the Executive Director of the African Population and Health Research Center. Dr. Chubutungi originally studied medicine, followed by a PhD in epidemiology and an MSc in community health and health management, and then joined the APHRC as a postdoctoral fellow in 2006, holding several leadership roles, including the center's Director of Research, before becoming the executive director. Amongst many other accolades, Dr. Chubatungi is also a member of the United Nations University, a fellow of the African Academy of Sciences, and is a co-director of the Consortium for Advanced Research Training in Africa, which is a program that seeks to build and strengthen the capacity of African research leaders. Dr. Chumpatungi, I would like to thank you for agreeing to come along and talk to us today. And I'm going to pass over to Isabella from Park, who will briefly explain which layer of power imbalance we will be discussing today. So Isabella, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Caroline, and welcome, Catherine, also very warmly from me. So um, as Caroline has said, this workshop series really is about considering in more depth than we might usually do, the various layers of power imbalance that typically shape um, collaborative research and the knowledge, the production of scientific knowledge um, between in, in partnerships, in research partnerships between actors in Africa and those outside of the continent. And um, we have structured the series in, in a way that we have one talk for one or more of the layers of power imbalances. Starting, right, and we usually em em envisage these power imbalances as a series of concentric circles, as you see here, it's just a heuristic, but uh, perhaps a, a, a relatively useful model. Starting right at the outer rim are the imbalances um, in the ways in which the practical arrangements for collaboration are configured. So these are questions of the division of labor, um, control over decision making on budgets, on research foci, on methodologies, approaches, over uh, the, the use of samples and of data once collected, and issues to do with access to rewards, in particular in relation to authorship um, on publications that arise from the joint inquiry. This is sort of the outer layer of imbalances. And it is, these imbalances are in many ways a reflection of or symptomatic of a number of more fundamental power imbalances in the production of scientific knowledge, starting with imbalances at the level of epistemologies and language at the very core, imbalances to do with the dominant use or hegemonic use of Western-centric theories, concepts, and an, an orientation to the West as the rightful site of scientific knowledge production and Africa as a site more or less of data collection, imbalance to imbalances that are uh, captured in the logic of the development frame, which imposes a unidirectional gaze always from the global North 
to Africa, a gaze that's never returned or reversed, um, and a frame that also limits um, the areas that are considered relevant for inquiry in the continent and leaves out many others that are priorities for Africa. And then a final layer that builds on the, the preceding four that has to do with the vastly disparate resourcing and capabilities of research and higher education institutions. So today um, we will start the series or the second talk in the series, we'll start with considering the collaborations right here at the outer layer, the, the, sorry, the imbalances at the outer layer, the practical um, imbalances in how collaborations are configured. And this is what Catherine will speak to. And without much further ado, Catherine, I will hand over to you um, and um, look forward to your talk. So. Uh, thank you so much, Isabella, and thanks, um, Caroline and Susan, and everybody to, um, for having me for this small talk for beef change. I like that. <laughs> I like that framing. And um, in a way, when I was reflecting about this topic, um, it sort of occurred to me, as it has done many times, that sometimes it's the small things that we do and the small things add up, either for change for the good or maybe for change for the bad. And therefore, um, this topic is, I, I mean, the framing is quite appropriate, that um, it may seem like a small talk, but somehow what we observe in the world is the collective action of millions, sometimes billions of people. And therefore, for this topic around an equal partnerships, which was the uh, brief I was given, really an equal partnerships don't come from Mars and drop on Earth, <laughs> planet Earth, and equal partnerships happen because we designed them that way. And therefore, um, our collective action as individuals, in actual fact, could dismantle this whole system that exists where an equal partnership are driving you know, global health inequity. And yet, that's what perhaps global health was not designed for. So I'll, um, I'll launch into my talk. And um, as I was also reflecting about you know, my framing for this, it occurred to me that um, an equal partnership uh, a function of vicious cycles. And I'll try to illustrate that in my talk, but um, I, I don't think I have the time to do justice to this, but it's an equal cycle. I mean, it's vicious cycles that are endless and they are self-reinforcing in a way. And at some point, uh, vicious cycles can only be broken if there's like an off-ramp and the off-ramp of course is us, is you and me and how we decide to um, behave in the way we design um, our work, our research, our programs, our studies, so that at some point, if, an, if a critical mass of individuals are designing programs in a way that takes us out, gives us an off-ramp out of these vicious cycles, then perhaps we can start seeing change in terms of um, you know, how global health is practiced and how global health is, um, exists in the current, in, in today's world. So I always like um, going to the, you know, the base about what is global health. And every time I look at this definition, it sort of reinforces the notion that like we are getting it wrong in more ways than one, because global health at its heart has equity in health for all people worldwide. And it's supposed to press a priority on improving health and achieving equity in health. And so you have to ask ourselves, um, are we, what they, when you think about global health practice, when you think about what you, what you do, what you're studying, and maybe what, what your dreams are when it comes to your career. Are you doing things to achieve equity in health for all people worldwide? And of course, global health is a function of these three interlinked areas. It is the studies, the practices, the research, but somehow there's, there are also sort of self-reinforcement, maybe that's the first vicious cycle, that global health research influences global health study, Global health study influences practice, the practice influences research, and so everything you know, keeps on going. But somehow, maybe one of the off-ramps, uh, maybe some of the most unequal partnership, uh, partnerships in global health exist in research. And therefore, in a way, when you think about um, unequal partnerships as a, an off-ramp of, um, of this vicious cycle, uh, how we design, how we conduct research in global health could, it be, an, could be an opportunity to get off the ramp. So this is the, uh, the, you know, how global health should be, that it's, it's about achieving equity in health for all people worldwide. But what it is in reality is different. And the reality here is more about the process that leads us to global health 
and the process the process is inequitable and in a way this is a result of unequal partnerships that have been perpetuated for many years and centuries perhaps and this is where we ended up and the, having this kind of picture where the majority of global health or global organizations that are active in health and health policy across uh, the globe being you know distributed in certain geographies is not an accident as i've said it is the little things that thousands of people have done over the years that have led us here where the leadership of global health is in the global north and the practice of global health largely is in the, is in the global south <laughs> So that's just one reality. The second is still a reflection of about decision making and power, because um, global health is practiced as a result of decisions which are made around what is important, what's a priority, what kinds of solutions should be put in place, what kind of resources should be allocated to different problems. And all these decision making and power, if they are concentrated in one part of the world, then of course, um, how, these, uh, the, how the decisions are made is distorted. And whether that achieves equity is debatable, it might, but in a way, my, my, uh, my um, theory is that if we are to achieve global health in, as an outcome, we need to think about how we practice global health in terms of the, the process and practice and systems that we put in place to achieve that equity. And if the processes are inequitable, if the systems are inequitable, then it's very unlikely that we are going to achieve equity as an outcome. And if we do, maybe we do it at a higher cost and we could be more efficient and more effective in the way we do that. This is another reflection, and maybe this is where the issue of, of um, unequal partnership comes in. Um, these are the top funders of research, global health research uh, on the African continent. And um, it's, this is not an old slide, but if you took this slide 10 years ago, maybe it wouldn't be that different. The numbers may have gone down a little bit or they may have gone up a little bit. But the, what we see is that in terms of the global health research done in Africa, most of the grants go to either US and high income institutions in, uh, for the case of NIH, uh, Fogarty, for Welcome, most of the uh, portfolios go to UK based institutions. For USAID it's the same, for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, for um, the amount of money that goes on the African continent, only about 11% goes directly to grantees on the continent. The rest is um, channeled through institutions in the global north, who then come and form partnerships with institutions in the global south, in this case, in the, on the African continent, to implement programs, implement research, implement projects that purportedly institutions in the global south don't have capacity to do that. So it's a system which has been set up in a way that um, um, sometimes you ask yourself whether it's a bug or it's a feature. In a way, I think it's a feature because the system for many years has benefited from unequal, unequal partnerships. And it's at a point where it is sort of safe reinforcing that um, if Welcome wanted to fund global health research, perhaps they wouldn't find the partners they want to absorb the 73% that is now being absorbed by UK institutions because there's not been a mechanism or a system that has been put in place to build the capacity of that 73% on the African continent to absorb that level of resources. So it, that's why I kept on talking about vicious cycles, that the system has been set up in such a way that it's safe reinforcing, safe perpetuating. And at some point you have to ask ourselves, how do we get off this cycle and you know, find ourselves an off ramp that in a way um, um, you know, we can break this cycle of um, inequity. So I looked at, I'm looking at equal partnerships as an entry point, but before that, um, this is the brief which I received about what, how unequal partnerships manifest. And unequal partnerships manifest in different ways. And I'll give some illustrations and our experience as um, the African Population and Health Research Center that um, unequal partnerships are manifest um, in joint projects whereby the division of labor uh, is different. In many, many instances, the African partners are the data collectors and the, um, you know, the people who participate in interpretation of findings once the data has been analyzed. And so what are considered, I would say, high value aspects of a scientific inquiry, the conceptualization, the analysis, the theories, the theorizing and interpretation is the sort of the preserve of the Northern partners and then the Africans become the data collectors. That is um, something which happens uh, typically. And then of course, the decision-making power, uh, what gets researched and why 
you know, some of it, that's, those are the features which are built into the system that um, what gets researched is a function of an identification of a gap that is based on the literature. But if we had to go back to where did this all start, you'll find that within the identification of gaps, there are also in inherent biases. And these inherent biases are also a function of an equal power and an equal partnerships. Because if you are an academic um, sitting in Bristol and you have um, you know, a research interest, and then of course you have had the resources to pursue that research interest, you've generated a lot of literature. Every new study you know, generates new questions and it you know, identifies other areas of inquiry. So the decision-making power has sort of been taken away from the, from the African partners to those people who have the time and the resources to keep on making research and finding new questions and new areas to pursue in terms of inquiry. But beyond that, it's a system which relies on an understanding of what, is, what counts as knowledge. And therefore, the literature gaps are biased in the sense that it gives prominence to that knowledge system that, pro that produces scientific literature rather than a knowledge system that maybe relies on lived experiences and other ways of knowing. So there's already some inherent bias within that whole decision making power on what is important and what is not important when it comes to priority research questions. But in the process of actually conceptualizing research, typically, again, based on our experience as an African institution, you will be approached by a partner from somewhere, um, out this time, let me say Bristol, and they'll say, hey, look, we are designing a project. Would you like to partner? And they say, yes, let's partner. And before long, you have the three-page concept note. Before long, it's a five-page concept note. Before long, it's a 30-page concept note. And before long, you're being asked, you're being given a small Excel sheet to fill in your budget. And you're, giving a, you're given a cup, which says, OK, you can't budget for more than 300,000 pounds. And so you know, fill everything in there. And this does not take into consideration about what you bring on the table. And it goes back to the division of labor. Because the budget which is being allocated to you is a function of, yes, you're going to collect data. And therefore, we think we have a good sense of how much it takes to collect this data. So um, if you're an African institution in a cash crunch, yes, you can feed in an, ex and, and, uh, you know, an Excel spreadsheet. Um, you find that your costs, your costs are not covered. And uh, you're like, oh, OK, it's still good enough. I need to cover staff. So you fill this budget, and the grant gets applied. Uh, I, I mean, you, you submit the application, you get funded. And then you do the data collection um, slash research. Then, of course, um, in many instances, if there's a capacity building focus, in typically the capacity strengthening um, is is of two types: the long-term PhD kind, postdoc kind training usually is for the northern partner, but the one you are going to build capacity in data analysis in a three-day workshop is for the African partner. And I've said many times, if you ask me from where I sit as an African, as a leader of an African institution, I don't need anybody. I don't need any upskilling. My staff don't need any upskilling. What I need as an African institution is money to hire people. I can get any skill I need in this context, in this environment. But in many instances, I still need to be capacitated in this and the other. And in some instances, that capacity, that's capacity building is sort of biased towards what a specific research project is aimed to achieve, not biased towards what it is that I need in terms of capacities. <clears throat> and of course, the last point in terms of access to rewards, um, if you give me a template, uh, an Excel template to fill in 300,000 pounds for a three-year project, many times you're not thinking about what is going to happen after the data collection. And so I, we have uh, typically grants where once the data collection is complete, once the data is clean, there's no time which has been allocated for us and our scientists to analyze the data and to write papers. And by then we've moved on to another similar grant. So it's a system which by design makes sure that um, African scientists, you know, you know they, they keep going further and further away um, from the Northern um, scientists who now have time to analyze, publish, go for conferences, and access the rewards that um, you know, are put in here. If you ask me to lead on a paper, if you ask my staff to lead on a paper, and there was no time that was built into the grant itself because you asked me to budget for a cap of 300,000, they won't lead that paper. They won't have time because their time is paid for by another grant to collect more data. 
So this is really uh, a good example and a good illustration of how an equal partnerships keep on perpetuating these cycles where people keep on, um, some people keep advancing further and further away in their career while, while others keep getting left behind. And to illustrate this, one of the, uh, maybe the first time I'm using this as a vicious cycle, this is a framework that looks at um, gender in academia, where maybe somebody starts um, in a low academic position, they don't have a leadership role, so they are less visible and they have less impact. But then that position, that positionality itself means that they are less likely to access grants, they're less likely to get research money, Therefore, they are less likely to, to be productive and visible. So all these cycles are sort of self-reinforcing. And there are parallels when you think about what happens when it comes to an equal partnership between North and South institutions. It's the same thing. I start as a postdoc in, uh, in Nairobi at APHLC. I'm not given the resources, the opportunities to be more productive, to be more visible. And therefore, with time, I sort of stagnate in my career. And going back to what I said earlier, this is a self-reinforcing self system where research-based knowledge drives influence, not just in terms of content, but also in terms of who becomes an expert eventually. If you start at time zero and you give this 10 years, after 10 years, the person who has access to the resources, the person who drives the partnerships, even though we also started as postdocs, in 10 years time, the postdoc at Bristol will be in a bigger, in a higher academic position, they have more influence, more visibility, they'll be attracting grants, while the person who started, who started as a postdoc in Nairobi, perhaps will still be relying on the person in Bristol to get access to the same resources. So how do these uh, partnerships, how does this um, unequal partnerships come about? And the question is, are they even partnerships? And I'll just try very briefly to go through um, our, our experiences at the African Population Health Research Center. So the typical partnership, as I've said, is a random email from somebody said, yes, I've got your email from XYZ and I'm looking for a partner um, in Kenya because I want to apply for a grant to maybe NHR, or UKRI, um, you know, I don't know, MRC, or whoever it is. And they're looking for African or Kenya-based partners. And so um, in some instances, you know, that is actually something which is quite is new. The fact that you, you're contacted before the grant has been submitted. In many instances, the partnership uh, request comes after the grant has been funded. So you asked, somebody has received a grant, they wrote a grant maybe a year ago, it's been funded, and now they're looking for partners, quote unquote, to implement it. And so in that case, they are no longer looking for research partners, they're actually looking for consultants to help them collect data. And that's one key lesson um, when it comes to, so what, what can we do? As, an, as APHLC, right from the beginning, we had principles that defined who were partners and principles who, decide, who, de, who dis, sort of defined who were consultants. So if we approached with an already funded grant, then we said, no, we didn't accept it. Because partnerships means that you start together, you conceptualize together, you budget together, and you identify our comparative advantage, not just as good data collectors, but as equals, as people who can think, people who can write papers, people who can analyze, people who can present in conferences, people who need to speak to government about the so what. Now we have the evidence from this research, then the so what. So all those aspects of our comparative advantage need to be catered for as we design and conceptualize the research from the beginning before it is five pages. So when you come with a partnership, quote unquote, of an already funded grant, then of course you, you dictate my capabilities, you dictate what I can do, you dictate what I know, you dictate my worth in terms of time. And um, yeah, as I've said, if you're in a crunch, in a vicious cycle again, then of course you take this kind of partnership. At APHRC, we don't. <clears throat> we don't take these kinds of partnerships. And if you look at our trajectory as an institution, I think that's part of the reasons why that um, we define together what's our role and we define together what's our contribution and we cost it. And if our cost is too high, then you go and find a partner, quote unquote, who's going to do it for cheaper or lower cost. And so this is the, the unequal partnership come about because the people who have access to the resources design them that way. And going back to what I said earlier, small talk for big change, 
yes, um, it starts with all of us. And what we see, what we observe is the result of thousands of people getting it wrong. So what would be the end result of such an equal partnerships? Of course, in the short term, as I've said, um, yep, I get people deploy them to do work for which they could have done more, but what is being dictated is do data collection. So we collect the data. Of course, the medium term, as I've said earlier again, ever increasing gaps because the grant that I received that was predetermined did not build in time for my team or for myself to analyze, to write. Writing takes time. And so if everybody's time is catered for by grants which focus on data collection, then of course there'll never be that time where, where my team can write. And with time when the grant ends after three years, the grant ends two years later, you know, there are 20 papers from Bristol, there's maybe zero paper from APHRC. Do that again for another three years, do it again after another three years, 10 years, as I've said, one person, 15 papers, 20 papers, another person maybe three or four or none. And so this is how the inequity you observe in global health comes about because the fact that you're able to publish your papers, there's a reason why you publish those papers. There's a reason why you get those grants. Of course, other than the reason why you do the research itself, that you generate knowledge and you contribute to an understanding of how the world works. But there's something it does for your profile as an academic that you get closer and closer to more having more power and influence, the more that you're able to build your profile. And those who are left behind, they become more and more dependent on you to um, you know, drive their own careers. So I said earlier that global health research really is a good entry point for um, dismantling the unequal partnerships, but also the power structure that exist, because um, career path that are a result of global health research uh, sort of confer expertise to if you've such um, area for 20 years and you've published 100 papers, you recognize this is the currency first recognition to that. And of course, depending on the choice, um, you may become um, um, a, a global leader. And if you have leadership credentials, then of course you have influence because you have proximity to power. You have proximity to funders. You have proximity to decision makers, those institutions that I showed, which are located mostly in the UK and the US. You have proximity to those decision makers which determine what happens in global health, who gets funded, what kinds of programs, what kind of priorities. But beyond that, um, as I've said, research also informs areas of study, both from a subject matter content, but also from determining um, specific areas of interest. And it informs practice. For instance, which problems get tackled and which solutions are applied, um, the biases and interests notwithstanding. So if research has been done in a specific area, then it's easy to say, yes, this is what we know, and this is the gap. If research has not been done in an area, sometimes we assume that that area does, is not important and we do research in other areas. And solutions, you can go to the, maybe the Gates Foundation and say, I want to do a solution which is not backed by literature. And where does that literature come from? It comes from the research that we do. So if we are to build, if you are to build a more equitable world, if you are to build more equity in health, then the beginning point really is inequitable partnerships. The partnerships that, you know, present career pathways for one side of the world, while there are no career pathways for the other side of the world. And in the end, the dominance of solutions and the dominance of problem identification, you know, falls of course in that part of the world where, um, um, you know, the influence eventually ends. So um, in, 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 in sum, trying to put all the things together, uh, if we start from, uh, you know, global health as it was conceptualized and the centrality of global health research in trying to um, sort of, lead us to um, leadership and influence. And then of course, if you take these vicious cycles, then it's no wonder that we are in a situation whereby the majority of funding for research on global health in African countries or in low and middle income countries ends up with institutions in the global south. And it's no wonder that these leaders, these experts, these influencers end up in these lead the positions of leadership in global health organizations. And they end up in other decision-making um, roles in global health leadership. So in sum, what can we do towards more equitable partnerships? 
Of course, we need to keep on learning and unlearning and understanding and acknowledging the interest for our systems in public health training, in research, in programs, and how that shapes the current global health practice. And I think this forum is one way of doing that. And also reflecting on personal roles, if any, in perpetuating a flawed, inequitable system. Um, some of you don't have any role, some of you do. And then try to dismantle those structures and power dynamics that uphold these power imbalances, both internationally and, and locally. But going back to where we started, that um, we need to advocate, we need to organize, we need to question, we need to demand, we need to drive a better system, and we need to aim for equal, respectful, meaningful, mutually beneficial partnerships, because it all starts with us. There's no magic wand to break the um, inequity that exists in the world now. There's no magic wand. It is us. It is how we design research. It's how we conceptualize it. And it's how we see um, partners in different parts of the world, their role, their agency, uh, their dignity. And um, um, uh, again, small talk for big change. Hopefully, um, when you look at the world and you see how almost everything seems to be stacked against change, against equity, when you see how broken the world is, sometimes it's easy to be discouraged, but I think um, it starts with us. And if we start small changes, they can lead to big changes. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions about our specific experiences, but APHRC, I think, is an example of an African institution which uh, for many years has had its own principles, its own guidance, its own rules, its own values, and it has served us well because we are an, an institution that grows, we're an institution that is successful, and I think there's a lot that um, yeah, you know, we can all learn from each other. So that's all I had. I had um, not a lot of time, 10 minutes or 15, and um, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. And so I'll hand it over back to Caroline, I guess. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Catherine. That was a fantastic talk. Um, and part of these um, series is to ask attendees to think about ways that they can make changes to their own practice as well. And I think that you have highlighted quite a few there that are um, very easy things for people to do with regards to, as you say, connecting with people before you set up that partnership from the very outset, you know, thinking about um, different things, having diversity of thought in your planning and designing process to remove biases. Um, I think I think that's all stuff that, that is really simple for people to be able to start thinking about and doing for their future projects. So thank you for that. Um, we do have a couple of questions and I know that we don't have a lot of time, but um, can I ask please, when you talk about what gets researched and why, um, as individuals, it's quite difficult to lobby, I guess, um, the funding bodies. So do you think that institutions in the global north should do more with regards to, to funding bodies and what funding is available and how that funding is structured? Yes, um, I actually don't think it's difficult to lobby funding bodies. Um, I think I've been in this space as an activist, if I could call myself that, in the last three years, and there's been tremendous change surprisingly easier than anyone would have imagined. And I think funding bodies are leading the change. So um, it's not difficult to lobby funding bodies. Of course, not all the funding bodies are on board, but especially the UK funding bodies, I think they are far ahead of most other funding bodies in other countries. And maybe that's the lobbying of how, what else can other countries learn from what UKRI, for instance, has done. So there's been a lot of change. There's a lot of change. The question is, um, it's, I don't think we are at a point where we can say, yes, it, this is perfect. So for instance, funding bodies are now evaluating the equality of partnerships. So where does the budget go? If you have a grant that you've designed and you're working with partners in Ghana and, and Kenya, and 70% of the budget is, spending in, is, is staying in Bristol, that's unlikely to fly, very unlikely to fly. So funders are checking for those things. Now, beyond that, funders are also checking the roles of partners. So if you can't have five work packages in your grant and all the work packages are laid from Bristol and yet the work is being done in Nairobi and I don't know, Zambia. So those things are being checked. 
the question is whether they're being checked consistently. The question is whether um, how much sort of premium is given to those kinds of transgressions, if I could call them that. But um, it's happening. Funders are changing the way they grant, the way they see good science. Good science is no longer just about amazing discoveries. Uh, questions about so what? What, what are you going to do with this, these discoveries are being asked? Um, what is capacity strengthening? So this change is happening, but I don't think we reached the point of saying it's optimal um, because most of these sort of metrics are not yet mainstreamed in a way that gives them as much weight as what is given to well-designed, robust, well-sampled, well, I don't know, well-powered study. So, but those things are happening. Yeah, thank you. Um, and it kind of leads on to another question we've had. So firstly, excellent presentation. Um, how can we transition from discussing the necessary steps to address unequal partnerships to effectively implementing those changes, despite ongoing conversations surrounding this issue and a clear understanding of what needs to be done? Why has progress been slow in achieving change? Yes, I, I think it's it's almost the same answer. There's been progress, and I said I've been pleasantly surprised at how much progress has happened. But of course, um, I said what we what we observe is the collective action of thousands of people for many years. So I don't think we've reached the point of having a critical mass of people thinking and doing the same, um, thinking the same way about how to dismantle these unequal partnerships. The UK is ahead. You know, most of the UK funders are ahead, but when you interact with funders from other parts of the world, not so much. So it will take a while before the funders come on board, but it will take a while also for uh, a critical mass of scientists, both from the North and the South, to recognize what needs to be done. And while this may look obvious, you'd be surprised at how much of this is not mainstream, even in Kenya or even in Uganda, you'd be surprised. So uh, when you're in a space, you think like this is common knowledge, but some of these things are not common knowledge, especially from, from scientists and, and um, researchers in the global South, they are not. They're still used to a certain way of doing business. And so um, that's why it's important that funders put in place safeguards. That's why it's important that academics and researchers from the global North do the right thing but then on the other side, we also need to see that funder, I mean, um, researchers and scientists from the global south uh, also demand what is right in terms of equitable partnerships. So we're still a long way in um, sort of diffusing all this understanding across the world. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's nice to see that progress is being made. Um, frustrating, obviously, that it is still quite <laughs> slow. Um, can, can we ask as well about differences um between research institutions within Africa as well so I guess that people might say that it's easier for scientists in the global north to connect with researchers in South Africa say um, so how would researchers go about trying to form collaborations and partnerships with researchers outside of um, South Africa, so, because, you know, the, the amount of publications that come out of South Africa tends to be the majority. Um, so how would researchers go about forming networks in other parts of Africa? Yes, I think I'll answer that in three ways. <laughs> the first one is you avoid unequal partnerships by establishing the partnerships before there's a deadline. I think that's something that is important. So don't start looking for partners when you have one month or two months to turn around an application and submit it. Then you're likely to engage in partnerships that are opportunistic, partnerships that are, you know, uh, what I talked about. So one way of building equal partnerships is to build them before there's pressure to turn around an application. Because if you put time in building partnerships, then you find the partners. But if you have two months to put together a partnership and an application and all the budgets, then of course you won't find them. You go to the, the low hanging fruits in South Africa. So that's one part which I'll talk about this. The second is like, yes, it's true. The visibility of African scientists, the visibility of African institutions is very low. And um, we are involved in an initiative where we found out that there are the journals in which academics in African universities publish, about 60% of them are not indexed. 
So even though you did Google Scholar or ResearchGate, whatever it is, or PubMed, you wouldn't find them. But it doesn't mean they're not publishing. They are actually publishing, but they're publishing in platforms which are invisible to the mainstream way of finding um, partnerships and, and, and uh, finding partners. And then, of course, they, they are, there are many other structural factors, like websites, whether they're updated, you know, whether there's an email that you can contact. But there's, there's a, a way African scientists are invisible. Some of it is cultural invisibility, where um, it's so, so, so hard to find a scientist. So I'll go with the easy one to find. And, but the other one is real. As I've said, the publications are hidden in places where no one can find them. So we are doing, we're opening an initiative actually to increase the visibility of African scientists and African institutions. And those are some of the ways in which um, it can be done. Now, the last point about um, even, even having said that, I think start from the assumption that there are very few African countries that don't have capacity. There are very few. So capacity, lack of capacity is the exception. It's not the norm. In almost every African country, there's a school of public health, a school of global health, a school of, I don't know, something where they are there are people who are qualified to be good partners. So you just need to try a little bit harder to find them. <laughs> and that and once you find them, yeah, I mean if you find a postdoc who has three papers, they may not be your copy eye. They could be a collaborator, but after five years, they still should they should they should be copy I right, not like the same way you found them because you didn't give them the resources to build their profile. So yeah, as I said that's the fourth way of answering this. <laughs> well, that's all really useful. Thank you. And another aim of these sessions is to work as well is to link a network or create a network of attendees. So um, people that are attending from Bristol and from the UK um, and also link to researchers in Africa. So fingers crossed, we're gonna get some nice research collaborations that, that come out of these events as well. Um, I think because of time, unfortunately, we've come to the end, but I would just like to thank you so much, Catherine, again, for fitting us into your schedule um, <clears throat> and coming along and talking to us about um, unequal partnerships and what tangible steps we can be taking as individuals in order to eradicate these. Um, thank you ever so much for coming along today. Thank you very much to all the attendees. Um, as I mentioned previously, there should be a link, hopefully in the chat now, to the recording of the first event, and we will upload this recording once we've had a chance to check that all the subtitles are correct and do the translation into French. Um, our next event is on the 9th of May, and the booking for that is now open on Eventbrite. And also, as I've mentioned, we would like to form a, a network of um, collaborations and researchers of attendees who come to these events. And so if you wouldn't mind, please, just taking a couple of minutes to fill in our uh, feedback form, which hopefully Rob can also post in the chat for me, please. Um, and on there, it does give you the option of allowing us to share your email address to form this supportive network as well. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you again, um, Catherine. It's been fantastic to meet you and um, hopefully we'll be um, working together again soon. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Catherine, for a wonderful session. See you all again. Bye-bye. <clears throat>